Hello, loved ones. Uh, once again, I'm happy that you have chosen to join us. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together again, even though it's virtually. I thank you, Father, for being God. I pray that your words will go forward, that you would open our understandings to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, the truth will set you free. And we have uh, a subtopic under that, which is our third declaration of freedom. Freedom from discouragement, no frustration, which is found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. And we've been looking at and paused at uh, verse 28, which reads, And we know that in all things God worked for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so we have said that even though God works all things for the good of those who love him, that does not mean that God does not love everybody. God desires that all would come to him, that all would love him. He created us to love and worship him. In the Garden of Eden, before sin, that was the norm, to worship God, um, and then sin entered the world and mankind was kicked out of the beautiful garden that God had made for them. And the amazing thing is that even though Adam and Eve messed up big time by believing Satan, God didn't just wipe them out and start over again, making a, a new and improved version. Humanly speaking, at least in my mind, that would have been more that would have made more sense when you consider that it was just two people and, and, and that would have uh, short circuited all of the sinful evil that was to come. And like I said, that was humanly speaking or Lamona speaking, uh, but spiritually speaking, when God created the first man, creation reached its climax. It is, seen, it is seen as a very special occasion. It seems that uh, when God got ready to create mankind, God had a consultation uh, with himself, the persons of the Godhead. And the conclusion was, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The human body, is a work of art, an amazing complex organism that only the wisdom of God could design and only the power of God could create. Uh, he gave us personality. He gave us minds to think with, emotions to feel with, wills to make decisions. Uh, he also gave us an inner spiritual nature that enables us to know him and to worship him. And so when God took a look at all of his creation, uh, Genesis 1 and 31 gives us his conclusion. He said it was very good. I, I said all of that to say that even though humanly speaking, or in my mind, it would have made more sense to just scrap humans and come up with a new and improved model. Spiritually speaking, before sin, 
Man was God's best. How can you get better than the image of God? David, after giving thought to God's creation, asked the question in Psalms 8 and 4, What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visited him? So the image of God in men and women has been marred by sin, but through faith in Christ and submission to the work of the Holy Spirit, believers can have a divine nature renewed within them. One day, when we see Jesus, all of God's children will be made new, and we will once again be in the glorious image of God. God's love for us, it's, it's beyond comprehension. God's love for us it, it is in no way does it eliminate his holy hatred of sin. As a holy God must deal with sin for the good of the sinner and for the glory of his name. For the sake of his own character and law, God must judge sin. But for the sake of his beloved son, God is willing to forgive sin. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> so God had already made provisions for forgiveness and salvation, but it was not revealed until the fullness of time. God loved us so much that he gave. John 3.16 in the message version says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. This verse, John 3.16, is the climax of the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Uh, for the last several weeks, we have been looking at the beginning of the chapter. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. No one really knows why, but, you know, it's fun to speculate uh, as to his reasons. Uh, we said that one such reason could have been uh, to have Jesus all to himself without competing with the crowd. But Nicodemus was obviously curious about the things he had heard and seen of Jesus. And so when face to face with Jesus, Nicodemus never really asked a question, uh, but instead, uh, you know, when he started the conversation, he made a statement. But Jesus, being the master teacher, answered not the words, but the thoughts of Nicodemus. If you uh, ever study the conversations of Jesus, you'll find that he often looked to thoughts of, of those asking questions rather than the questions themselves. Jesus had a way of getting around all of the the the. wasting time issues <laughs> and just zooming in on, on the on the real situ on the real question Nicodemus came seeking to know something about the kingdom of God he he started the conversation by saying rabbi we know you are a teacher who has come from God small talk for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him and Jesus responded by answering his thoughts and said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So Jesus knows our core issues and that and that is where he zooms into. He didn't Jesus didn't have one prepared speech that he used for everybody. Uh he spoke to the occasion. Uh, to the woman at the well, he spoke of living water. To the rich young ruler, he spoke about riches in heaven. And to Nicodemus, he spoke about the new birth. 
And, and to all who he spoke, they were astonished by his teaching. So last time we said that when Jesus told Nicodemus that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again, that we said that Nicodemus realized that he was part of the no one. But we said that he also, in the unless or except, he heard hope. And so he sought to understand this mystery called new birth. In verse 5, Jesus answered Nicodemus' question by saying, uh, in, in verse 5, in verse 4, he really did ask a question, uh, like, how can this be? And, and verse 5, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And so if you recall in verse three, Jesus said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again, which means no one can grasp it. No one can understand it or know it or experience the kingdom of God. Now he says that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit which he's saying nobody, no one can gain entrance into the kingdom of God. So Jesus is reemphasizing the importance of the absolute necessity of being born again, letting Nicodemus know and letting us know that you must be born again. Nicodemus' inability to understand what Jesus meant really was a demonstration of Jesus' point that when he said that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Nicodemus' uh, flesh was showing born of the flesh, which is the human mind, means you cannot grasp the mysteries of the kingdom of God nor can the flesh understand the fullness of God. That can only come from a spiritual transformation, a renewing of the mind that is made new through Jesus Christ. Uh, we can't study upon it. We can't uh, go to a particular school to get it. It only comes through Jesus Christ. And, and so this is why the Pharisees often struggle to understand or accept the message and the ministry of Jesus. And, and this is also why the world cannot accept the message of salvation. To be born again is to be born of the Spirit. This is hard for the world and its systems to understand. It, it's just, it's like speaking Greek. Uh, of the flesh, you cannot understand it. The difference between the flesh and the spirit is, is the reason rebirth is necessary. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 19 through 21, Paul tells us that the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. To which he says that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We should point out that the flesh in itself is not sinful. The flesh or human body is God-given and is for God's purpose. When a person is converted to Christ, when he's born again, his body becomes the temple of God to dwell in through the Holy Spirit. So we are not told to cleanse ourselves from the flesh, but from the lust of the flesh and from the works of the flesh. The works and the lust of the flesh are seen 
in the sin that lives in us and in the world. We see how strong um, that is in, in that it it works, its works, sin's works, or the flesh works, are seen throughout society. It, it's seen all over the TV. It's seen within every community. It's seen in the workplace, in the government, in the home, in the school, on the billboards, uh, the commercials. Everywhere life is present on planet Earth, sin is seen. The works of the flesh is seen. We certainly, at least I wouldn't, want to go to heaven and find more of the same stuff. Thank God that his heavenly kingdom is not made for the kinds of bodies that we have now. Who wants to be in heaven uh, with these bodies decaying and, and, and just going bad and all the fleshly things that happen? Who wants that? Nobody. So, so this earthly body will be instantly transformed to be like Jesus when he returns. So Jesus implied to Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh. It's going to act like flesh. Therefore, it will not be in the kingdom of heaven. Now the flip side is that that which is born of spirit is spirit. Whereas the flesh produced dead works, the spirit produced living fruit that keeps on producing more and more fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. And, and note, we, we should also note that the word fruit is singular. It is not the fruits with an S of the Spirit. It's the fruit which is singular. The, the Holy Spirit has only one fruit and it's broken down into a list of traits in order to help us understand his nature. For example, if I had an apple, just one fruit, if I were to give a description of it, I might say that it's, it's red, it's juicy, it's sweet, maybe with a little tart, I, I could go on, you know, because it could be yellow, it could be green, and, and I could go on and on about its characteristics, which may be many, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm only talking about one fruit. Now, it's possible for the flesh to fake it, uh, to make it look like it's producing the fruit of the Spirit. You know how we can put on uh, such airs and act like we're all this and we're not. We can act like we're all this in a bag of chips, but we're not. We, we've all seen fake fruit that looks like the real thing until you bite, take a bite into it. The flesh can never produce the real fruit of the spirit. The flesh seeks its own glory. When the flesh is at work, the person might try and be all humble on the outside, but inwardly, they're praising themselves. And eventually, it shows up on the outside. And, and not only are they praising themselves, they're seeking and even craving uh, compliments of others. When the spirit produces fruits, God gets the glory. The work of the Spirit is to make us more like Christ for his glory, for his praise, for his worship, not for the praise of men. Well, that's all I have for today. Join us again next time as we continue in our study of Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus. Remember, we're on the scenic route. And how long it lasts, I don't know. Uh, those at, at Mount Sinai know that I can take a thing and, and, and it lasts for a while. So we're on the scenic route, and, and, but we will return 
where we left off at. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. See you next time, or join us next time since I won't actually see you. Goodbye.